Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Welcome to this week. Uh, we got uh, Scott uh, in upstate. Hey, Scott. Hey, Joe. Hey, Tony. Hello. Hey, in the great city of St. Louis, who has just published a new book. So congratulations, Tony. Well, thank you. Thank you. Be, what's the name of it? It's called Let Them Tremble, uh, Biographical Interventions Marking 100 Years of the Communist Party USA. Celebrating our 100th anniversary. We're going to be talking about it in just a minute. But before that, a lot of big events happened this week. The first thing was the impeachment of Donald Trump. Tony, how did that play in St. Louis? Are people excited about it, sad about it, indifferent about it, don't give a who, uh, <laughs> well, in, in, uh, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> well, in St. Louis and uh, Columbia, which is in mid-Missouri and Kansas City, I think people are very excited about it. In terms of rural Missouri, uh, maybe a different, uh, different response. Different response, yeah, okay. And uh, from where you are, Scott, what's the... Um, there's a, you know, there's a small core, uh, most of the people around the, you know, the, the Democratic electoral campaigns. Uh, that are very, um, you know, very excited uh, about it. Um, you know, really, you know, on social media, that's the that's the main issue. Impeach, impeach. Um, uh, but I live in a in a town where seventy five percent of the people vote, and seventy percent of them vote for Trump. Hmm. Wow. No, but I thought you were supposed to be somber and sad. This is a sad occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you're not buying that. Uh, what, what, what? What do you guys think? It's a very serious issue. It is. It's a very serious issue, and it had to be done. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, not to do it would have been to uh, accept, you know, the idea of Trump as kind of a royal king, kind of dictatorship, kind of uh, well, position, and you just couldn't accept that. You know what I mean? There's also, yeah. there's also something unacceptable about it from a like a working class perspective. If you think about, you know, what workers go through on the job, like random drug tests, evaluations where you have to provide just every scrap of paper that you come into contact with, audits of all your, you know, communication and everything. Yeah. It's the constant surveillance. And then, you know, the, the most powerful person, arguably in the world, at least in this country, um, you know, claims that everything that he does should be, you know, outside of supervision with no accountability, no um, oversight of any sort. It's, it's offensive. Well, I'm all of them a goddamn drug test. <laughs> <laughs> then go down to Congress, Democrat and Republican. Yeah, there you go. All of them. There you go. <laughs> People on welfare drug tests. I mean, that, just, yeah. that is just so outrageous. But a yeah. guy sent me a note yesterday and he said, Joe, shouldn't we distinguish ourselves from the Republican talking points uh, with respect to national security uh, and the impeachment issue. Um, and I had to think about that for a, a minute, you know, um, because my, what, what do you guys think first before I, you know, offer my, my, my assessment of it? Should we, do we necessarily have to distinguish ourselves from the uh, Democratic talking points on the national security issues? I think, I think seeing this as an opportunity to mobilize and educate as a prelude to the November 2020 elections, uh, at the very least, it's, it's, it's you know, going to mobilize people, educate people, and I think, um, you know, get more people out knocking doors and ready for the elections in 2020. So at, at the very least, that should be a focus and a you know a part of our overall thinking and strategizing when it comes to the electoral process. Um, you know, I, I agree. I think this had to be done, and for it to not be done would have sent a very clear message that uh, Trump is above the law, that he's above the Constitution, and that we might as well shred uh, the Constitution and, and everything. So I think it had to be done, but I think people are also focused on. Uh, 2020 uh, elections and seeing this as the first the first step in in hopefully uh, changing the direction of our country. Right. Now, good point, Scott. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think we we don't set our our analysis our our line on things by 
um, the need to distinguish ourselves or um, compare ourselves with this or that group. We set it on the basis of our understanding of, you know, the needs of the working class and the broad movement. Um, so di distinguish, our, that, that's a messaging, branding question, whatever, and it's not at the forefront of my mind. That said, our understanding of it, or my understanding of our understanding anyway, is very distinct. Like, um, we're not talking about uh, national security and, and the, the Russian threat or whatever. We're talking about the main threat to democracy in this country, which is the extreme right and the Trump regime and the need for uh, a vast uh, working class led democratic movement to, uh, to displace it. And the, the impeachment as a reflection of the, the growth of that movement. Yeah, so yeah. we are very distinct. That's a great way to put it. There were, there were big demonstrations all over the country the night before the impeachment. But I gotta <laughs> say, you know, uh, at the same time, we're not national nihilists. And so we're not like, you know, we don't ignore the national security uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I'm not like, you know, jumping on the anti, you know, Russian bandwagon, you know, uh, but at the same time, I'm not ignoring the uh, a possibility that they did intervene in 2016 uh, and that they might have something in their back pocket on Trump. You know what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say? I'm not ignoring that, that possibility. Uh, but the United States, on the other hand, intervenes regularly in every single country in the world. The most recent example which was Bolivia. And, and we need to, to recognize well, that. I don't want to be hypocritical about this kind of an issue. Yeah. We need to recognize what, Scott? Um, sorry, I lost my, my, my thought there. Uh, well, it's OK. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll continue with <laughs> So, um, but I think that democracy is a working class issue, you know. Yeah, I was gonna say, we have to distinguish between national security and, you know, whatever security the, uh, the various um, national ruling classes are trying to establish for themselves. Like our security is not the security of the of the bourgeoisie. Yeah, well, our security comes uh, with jobs, greater, greater democracy, you know, getting rid of racism, getting rid of sexism, homophobia. Expanding healthcare. Control of, huh? Say what? Expanding healthcare. Expanding healthcare, getting rid of the corporate control of the media, getting money out of politics, and so on and so forth. These are all in, important issues. I thought it was interesting that the uh, Pelosi decided not to send the uh, impeachment to the Senate because it was going to be a, a kangaroo, I don't want to say a gorilla court, <laughs> <laughs> a kangaroo court. And boy, they kind of, you know, McConnell does remind me a little bit of McGilla, gorilla. Yeah. But anyway, you know, kangaroo kind of court in uh, the Senate. They're not going to just let it railroad. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's shrewd. I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, was a, it, it was a good, 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 good move. Well, so what else happened this week? Anything else that we need to uh, talk about? Um, it, uh, it, 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 uh, that, that Senate uh, uh, decision uh, to uh, the Republican majority was obviously uh, not something that was acceptable. And I think that the uh, Democratic response has been good. Um, and now we are on the verge of the holiday season, and so we want to wish all of our uh, friends and comrades and sisters and brothers a, a happy holiday, a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa. If you're an old heathen like me, you know, a good secular. <laughs> I wanted to go back to something Tony said uh, about the impeachment, um, stressing the importance of, you know, the proving that demonstrating that Trump is not above or beyond the Constitution. Um, and I think this is something that surprises uh, people sometimes about our party uh, is our mm -hmm. uh, our approach to the democratic, limited democratic heritage, you might say, within capitalism. And it's also uh, that's the subject in some way of the first chapter of Tony's book, which I've got here, Let Them Tremble, um, uh, on Arnold Johnson and the, the fight for uh, free speech rights. 
So could you talk a little bit about that, Tony? Well, so Arnold Johnson is a really interesting uh, uh, personality in, in the history of the Communist Party and his uh, biography. And just so folks know, the, the book uh, is actually a collection of six short-ish biographies and Arnold Johnson is one of those. And uh, his story really revolves around the uh, Communist Party's defense of the Bill of Rights, particularly during the McCarthy era and the early 1960s when the Smith Act and the McCarran Act in particular were being used to stifle uh, free speech, were being used to ban communist uh, speakers from college and university campuses. And so we find throughout the historical record, um, document after document, personal letter after personal letter, correspondence after correspondence of this deep, deep belief and, and struggle for the defense of the Bill of Rights and free speech um, championed by communists, which isn't typically the story we're told in the dominant historiography of the U.S. Communist Party. And so uh, Arnold Johnson really proved to be an, an, a really amazing character uh, and personality to try to bring this story forward to talk about the Communist Party's defense of the Bill of Rights and free speech particularly after 1956, uh, where again, most uh, historiography is written from the perspective that the Communist Party became a marginal force uh, after 1956 because of McCarthyism, because of the uh, Khrushchev revelations and other uh, security measures that were taken at that time. And so, so I, I utilize the story of Arnold Johnson as a way to elevate this uh, defense of the Bill of Rights by the Communist Party. And there was a free speech movement, Tony, that kind of that was kind of born out of that uh, uh, struggle. Can you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and so, if if we recall, uh, in the uh, 1948 is when the first indictments came down of, of the leadership of the Communist Party at that time, and that indictment in 1948 ushered in basically a decade of civil liberties retreat. And so from 1958 forward, we find a, uh, a, a challenge, uh, not that there wasn't challenges from 48 to 58, but we begin to see a shift in of the political winds. And that's precisely how Gus Hall and Arnold Johnson and other communist leaders of the time characterized it was as a shift in of the political winds. And so from 58, 59 forward, we begin to see the beginnings of uh, uh, a wave of college and university speaking engagements whereby over the course of three or four years from 61 to 64, um, communist speakers conservatively, a conservative estimate is that communist speakers spoke to at least at least 100,000 students on various colleges and university campuses across the country. There's one uh, particular uh, speaking engagement in the uh, Northwest in Oregon, where Gus Hall had been invited to come and speak at the University of Oregon in, I think, 1962, uh, February of 1962, where 12,000 students showed up at one, at one speaking engagement to hear Gus Hall talk about yeah. the Communist Party, Marxism, Leninism, and the defense of the Bill of Rights. And 12, 12,000 students showed up, and it's it's also estimated that on that particular uh, West Coast speaking engagement trip that Gus Hall spoke with accumulatively, so the 12,000 students was by far the largest, but over the course of five or six days, he spoke with accumulatively 19,000 students um, on the West Coast who came to hear communist speakers in, def in defense of the Bill of Rights, uh, and, and so this is an amazing Part of the history of the U.S. Communist Party, as well as the history of the struggle for civil rights in our country, that is largely untold. And well, did the party I'll, have I'll a, a rally? Go on, Scott. I, I was going to say, did, did the party have um, uh, a sizable audience among uh, college students before that? Um, and the, did it, and did it affect our recruiting and our growth? 
So there, <laughs> excuse me, there was um, a number of different party led formations that had come into being around this time as well. You had what was called the Advanced Youth Organization. You had the Progressive Youth Organizing Committee, as well as a publication called New Horizons for Youth that were all party, party led, party initiated youth organizations that had chapters and clubs on college and university campuses across the country at the time. Um, but but I, it, the story isn't just a story of the communist initiated or communist led youth organizations. This was much, much broader. And in fact, the National Student Association, which at the time was the largest student group in the country and would later in the 1970s, maybe 1980s, merge with another student group to become the United States Student Association, USSA, which is still the largest youth organization in the country. Um, at that time, the National Student Association would work with advanced youth organization with the Progressive Youth Organizing Committee and Horizons uh, for Youth um, to challenge McCarran Act thought control on the campuses by organizing these speaking engagements in collaboration. And so it's a really interesting history. And, and simultaneously, you saw the beginnings of the birth of the Students for a Democratic Society Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which would also partner with uh, Advanced Youth Organizing Committee and Progressive Youth uh, uh, Youth Group, and so to to to, to characterize it as just a, uh, and I don't think you're doing this, Scott, but but you know I want to make sure that people know is that the point isn't to say that all of these communist-led groups were on campuses doing X, Y, and Z. They were, but they were working in partnership with broader youth and student groups, which is really important because the story of the 60s uh, has largely been told as the story of the new left. But what we find is that the Communist Party and communists were very much a part of these movements. Very important point. Now, your book also talks about a number of other communists, Gus Hall, Charlene Mitchell, and who else? Um, so the, the six the six subjects in the book, uh, Arnold Johnson, uh, Charlene Mitchell, Henry Winston, Gus Hall, Alpheus Hunton, and Judith LeBlanc are the six uh, main uh, personalities that are covered in the book. Now, Alpheus Hudson, he's not a well-known character. You want to say a few words about him? Absolutely. And, and I, I actually would hope to do more work on the life and times of Alpheus Hunton in future projects. But uh, Alpheus Hunton, uh, African-American civil rights leader <coughs> who started his activist career at Howard University in the 1930s, uh, helping to organize the uh, uh, American Federation of Teachers uh, local at Howard University, and then went on to become a leader of the National Negro Congress in Washington, D.C., and joined the NNC executive board and worked with other communists like James Ford, uh, Henry Winston, and uh, Doxy Wilkerson, who were also very much a part of the NNC at the time. And so uh, Alpheus Hunton uh, not only helped to organize the union on the teachers union on Howard University, but he also worked with the NNC and the Communist Party in D.C. to challenge police brutality and the uh, indiscriminate killing of black folks in D.C. by the D.C. Police Department. And so he, he really cut his political teeth there in D.C. And then in about 1942, 1943, he was offered a position as the educational director of the Council on African Affairs, which was a uh, organization led by Paul Robeson, and later uh, W.E.B. Du Bois became part of the Council on African Affairs uh, staff as well. And the CAA was in many ways the domestic linchpin of the Black liberation movement uh, in Africa. And so it developed and uh, facil facilitated in the building of ties between African Americans here and Africans fighting for liberation in Africa. Um, and so it, it, in, in many ways brought forward and carried forward what would become the uh, uh, divestment movement, you know, 20 or 30 years later. Um, That's a very interesting picture of Kwame Nkrumah along with Shirley Graham Du Bois um, and uh, the Islander Robeson. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all together, and Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and Kwame Nkrumah was, was kind of, you know, gave a portrayal 
What's the name of the book again? So the name of the book is Let Them Tremble, uh, Biographical Interventions Marking 100 Years of the Communist Party USA. And where can you get it? Well, it can be, it can be bought uh, wherever quality books are sold, um, but it's been published by international publishers. And so you can go directly to the international publishers website or on Amazon or barnesandnobles.com or uh, your progressive local bookstore should be able to order it for you and, and get it within a couple of days. You want to show that cover again, Scott? Let Them Tremble by Tony Pepsinowski, dealing with greats like Gus and Henry Winston and Charlene and uh, Arnold Johnson, Judith LeBlanc and, and, and uh, 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 Brother Hudson. So um, thank you for that contribution, uh, Tony, in celebration of our 100th anniversary. Well, you know, uh, I think we should wrap this up. Uh, the, uh, we're trying to put some uh, markings on the decade uh, in the last few days of this year by calling on our readers and friends to share with us the 10 best books, 10 best records, 10 best poems, uh, 10 most important e events of the last uh, decade, 2010 to 2020. Scott. Well, what were the 10 most, give me oh, two most I'm, important events okay. of the decade. Uh, I'm going to say um, the passage of the Affordable Care Act in okay. and, um, which was the, the first recognition of something like um, a universal democratic right to health care, um, imperfect as it was, uh, and the emergence of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement um, uh, in Great. response to police brutality. Ray, Tony, what about you? Well, as uh, someone who lives a hop, skip, and a jump from Ferguson, Missouri, uh, and with the killing of Michael Brown, I'm also going to say the the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. But I'm also, but I would add to that uh, this this new and uh, emboldened uh, discussion of socialism that has emerged over the past four or five years that we just did not see uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. This is really an amazing new phenomena that people are talking about socialism uh, in the mainstream. I mean, people may uh, have different understandings of what socialism means to them, but I think the very fact that that discussion has taken place is, is really important. The emergence of the socialist moment. What about you, Joe? Uh, I say what well, I would say the defeat of the Republican majority in the House of Representatives uh, in the last midterm, hugely important, you know? Um, I can't think of anything more Im important, you know, it was just, uh, it set the stage for the impeachment and the overall fight back against Trump. And the other thing I would say is the emergence of the uh, women's movement uh, mm -hmm. to uh, a, a whole new level with Me Too, with the demonstration against Trump the day after the inauguration. Mm -hmm. Uh, that too is a hugely, hugely, the coming together, Black Lives, uh, the uh, immigrant rights movement, the, the women's movement, you know. Uh, and then I would say, you know, there's been the, the growth of the strike wave over the last year yeah. or so. Yeah. With the new- The teachers. In the trade union movement and the, and the notion that workers can fight and win. Yeah. That's yeah. a big, big thing. And it's moving, these, these movements are cross current, they're crossing, intersecting, uh, affecting each other and in a very dynamic and, and important way. Yes. So I'm very hopeful that we can defeat Trump in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2020, 2020, in a few days, we'll be at 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that just about does it. Scott, do we have anything new up on the website? Yeah, we got quite a few things. Um, we have uh, under our discussion on working class leadership, um, uh, an article by Anita Waters, The Power of Mobilizations of Public Workers, um, getting to the, the teachers unions that Tony mentioned. Um, an article by Lori Nandrea uh, about how to translate um, the growing popularity of unions into uh, political action. Um, we've also got, take a look here. Uh, Let's give us two more. Would be enough. Yeah. Oh, new episode of The Spectre on. Um, uh, Baristas and and the the struggle for um, those are people that work in coffee shops, not people yeah. who are behind bars, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
uh, and um, on our, our holiday greeting card as well, and our party statement on impeachment. So quite a few things. Great. Go to cpusa.org to check it out. After you do that, go to the International Publishers website, order Tony's book, Let Them Tremble. Um, go to a party this holiday season. Have a beer or a cup of cider or a cup of tea, please. You know, if you're a juicer, whatever you do to, you know, get your, uh, satisfy your Jones. <laughs> it, um, as long as it's drug free. We, we there don't you go. Encourage, uh, anybody to uh, engage or imbibe in that respect. And I want to wish you both a very, you know, happy holiday season and a happy yep. new year. That's it for us. Until uh, next year, we'll come back the first Friday of the month uh, with a new edition of this week. So happy holidays, everyone, and take care. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Good talking to you, Tony. Good talking to both of you. See you later. <laughs>